I want to begin with three very, very interesting talks in this session, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Ian White from the School of Environment and Development from the University of Manchester. And Ian is going to start this morning's sessions with a talk entitled Water in the City, Risk, Resilience and Planning for a Sustainable Future. I should preface this by saying that I'm also involved in an EU project for around five and a half million euros looking at flood resilience at the building scale. So essentially defences behind the defences, if you like, trying to think what if the defences fail, how can we be more precautionary? Um, so some of the work, particularly towards the end of the uh, session, will draw upon that. Um, I'd like to start off with this slide, um, partly because it just wakes people up after a coffee break, um, and also because on the first glance, it's actually really, really terrifying. We've got um, the time <coughs> here, and on the other axis, we've got the number of disasters reported, or natural disasters, if you like. So, at first glance, that's quite a worrying trend. But we do need to think about the data quite differently. Since, um, for example, the last 20, 30 years, we've got what's called the theory of time, space compression, or in more layman's terms, the world's smaller, we get around quicker and we know more about what's happening elsewhere. So is there more natural disasters or is it just that we know about them more quickly? Um, we also need to think about well, what exactly is a natural disaster? What do you have to do to actually qualify to be on this chart? Um, and the criteria is on the screen there. Is that you need to have a certain amount of people injured and so on. And so we can start to see that how we collect data will influence how we react and how we perceive disasters to occur. And then we also have this uncertain causality. And looking at this, you might think this maps quite well onto population increases or urbanisation increases, and it does to a certain extent. But we still can't be sure that the reasons why it's happening is that simple. So why is it happening? Well, first of all, as I touched on by Ray earlier, we may be getting more extreme events um, which amplify the hazard, amplify the risk. The risk isn't static, it moves around. And so we're in this world where risk seems to be escalating and amplifying. And part of that is because we're getting more extreme events. Uh, more extreme events are more likely to occur. And some of our, the way that we manage water aren't set up for extreme events, more above average events. And that paper there, is exactly the same paper that Ray referred to earlier, from 2011. Then there's more social issues that perhaps, well, we play a role. It's not just weather. We're not just um, waiting and reacting for things to happen to us. Perhaps we're playing a role as well. Perhaps the way that we govern water makes it difficult to manage it. Perhaps the way that our institutions are set up uh, particularly within disciplinary silos, makes that quite difficult to talk to each other. And then, we're perhaps with more people are more exposed to risk. Not only are there more people, there's more developments, more the safer areas have gone, you've got more unsafe areas and so on. And then we've got the more people-orientated view, where perhaps certain people, or certain groups of people, certain countries, are more vulnerable to experiencing the effects. I was at a talk in Helsinki last year, and two th at the time, I think two-thirds of the country's talent was underwater, and yet only a certain proportion of the country was flooded, because you need to be underwater for 30 days for it to count as a flood. So those people are quite well adapted to managing water, and perhaps us in certain countries elsewhere might have some lessons, an exchange of lessons between cultures. The other thing to bear in mind is that this is essentially the transition of why it's become more the remit of planning and away from just the cell engineers. It's because we're not exactly sure of the certainty of the information and we also know that there's social aspects which we can do which really can improve the situation as well. Things we perhaps haven't had to do in the past. And this is a good example of how we actually did it in the past. This is the Isle of Tewkesbury during the 2007 floods in the UK. And this is how we defended against flooding. 
who built on high patches of land. They got there first in 1102, and so um, everyone else since then has been building around them. We have urban extensions which are less safe and less at risk. So we also need to know that flooding isn't a modern phenomenon. We've always been flooded, um, no matter whether we're built up or not, because we've always had more extreme events. Um, it's the way that we manage the flood risk that's become important, because if there wasn't actually that many of us around and we didn't have such a dense urban landscape, we could actually build high up. When the Dutch engineers came over and taught us how to drain land and so on and build um, defences to protect against water, we started to do that. And then during the mid 20th century, that was really, so the late 20th century, that was really exposed, particularly in the UK, as not necessarily the way to go around doing things. And it also started to challenge the view of the source of flooding. And this is one of the things I want to emphasize from today's talk is that flooding from rivers and the sea is very, very spatially convenient, particularly managerial convenient as well. We know where it is, we know where there's a line, and that's where we defend it. It's when we've got more extreme interurban events, surface water flooding, pluvial flooding, where essentially it's really difficult to manage because we don't know where the sources are. There's not one source of risk, there's multiple risks going around the urban area. This is the Thames in London, and it essentially exemplifies how we've managed water, an excess of water in the environment, is that we put bricks on top of other bricks, which works quite well, um, particularly for areas which we really want to protect, high value areas and so on. Um, the other point I'd like to mention is by taking this dominant approach, we've also helped institutions and professions to actually enable this to happen. So, um, we have the Environment Agency, which is centred around <coughs> flood risk, rather than surface water, for example, or drainage, which is a separate institution. It's all based around probability, the, the actual size of the event it's meant to manage against, and so on. And so all this investment was centred around this approach. And this is something that, although works really well, as the risk shifts around flooding in the sea, it's something we, I think we need to temper with a slightly different approach. We also need to bear in mind that we've never known as much about water and flooding as we do now. We've never had as much money, we've never had as much probability and expertise. And if that's the case, why are we still getting flooded? So bear that in mind as we're going around this talking today, is that despite all our knowledge, we're still getting flooded. So we need to think differently about how we actually manage water and so on. So because we're still getting flooded, we saw these events, Particularly in the UK, we had a huge demand for action and more ways of actually, you can always rely on the Daily Mirror to actually come up with something <laughs> slightly inappropriate. Um, but we had this huge demand to manage water differently. If we know so much about it, we're paying our taxes, we want the state to defend against it, and they weren't. So that really changed how we actually manage water. And from a UK perspective, it's this slide which really is the centre of this talk. This is where it might actually, hopefully it might surprise some of you about how knowledge, which we were very certain about in 2001, we were incredibly uncertain about 10 years later. So after the 2000 floods, which you saw on the slide before from Ray, we did a, an audit of, okay, how many people are at risk? Because we don't know. Um, and there was a very, very precise figure of 1,724,225, not 26, not 24, 25. We knew that for certain. And I remember when that information came out, and we were, it's good knowledge, it's new knowledge, and we were quite certain about it. And then we had another flood event in 2002, um, and we actually did an audit of the amount of flood properties at risk again. Um, and this came on the full site report in 2004. We've got a very similar amount of figures, but we had this new figure I'd like to draw up on this 80,000. Mm -hmm. This was essentially the amount of people at risk from poor drainage flooding who have been registered as at risk with the drainage authorities. So we had new data that perhaps there's more than one source of flooding. It's not just the rivers and the sea, it's also the way that we manage water with regard to how we determine the pipe size, where they go and where the house are and so on. And then things get really messy. Um, 
And that's when everyone concerned with water just went, ah, might as well, um, let's think about things slightly differently. Because gone from zero properties at risk from surface water and drainage flooding 10 years ago to 3,800,000, just eight years later. And this is almost... Use as an example about knowledge and certainty in evidence-based planning and maps. Some of the words we've already talked about today is that we're not actually certain how many people are at risk. And we need to bear that in mind that when we see maps, we need to question the data. We need to question how it got it. And we need to think more precautionary despite having the maps and the evidence. So that really changed the landscape. The major source of flood risk in the UK is not from the rivers and the sea. It's from intense rainfall events in urban areas which is so difficult to fend against because where do you build the wall? So we also need to think carefully about using this data as well. Um, there are definitions of risk do vary slightly between the documents. It's not, a, it's not a, an exact science. Um, but even regarding that, it's more about certainty and knowledge than about the pure numbers. It's about how certain we are about using an evidence-based approach as the sole way to manage risk. So we've got some key issues from this small section, is that we perceive flood risk to be homogenous. That is, it comes from one source. So we have flood risk, it comes from the rivers and the sea, it's always done that for as long as we can remember. And now there's a sea change where we're starting to think, well, that's not necessarily the case. Flood risk comes from multiple sources, it comes from groundwater, it comes from poor drainage and drainage failure, and it comes from surface water flooding as well, each of which demand different managerial strategies, and perhaps even governance um, arrangements depend on who's responsible. So perhaps we are getting better at managing floods. All that investment is working. We're just getting flooded by a different source, which is backed up by the data. Um, we also have this... Um, Reliance on engineering and engineering defences. Engineering defences have been excellent, provided really good um, protection to many of the cities. Um, this talk isn't about denigrating that, it's about trying to supplement that with different approaches as well. We do need engineering defences. We need what well, we also need to think about behind the defences. And then we might have what's called the principle of stationarity, whereas we saw from Ray's talk earlier, things don't stay the same, but We've assumed we do. So when we talk about a one in a hundred year defence, it's a one in a hundred year defence at point X, but at point Y it might be one in 80, as the drivers from urbanisation and the drivers from climate change change the probability of that event. There's an interesting... Um, I was in Prague, where, and there was a talk from the Director of London in Prague, and... They had a, a one in 1,000 year event in 1997. And then they had a one in 1,000 year event in 2002. And his argument was that technically it's a different millennium and that could be expected. <laughs> so we need to bear in mind that there's also different ways of presenting data and we need to be more cautious about how we use the data. And that also means broadening out our methodology for how we manage water. It's not just the case of um, relying on probability and quantification because some things are really hard to quantify. Interurban flooding and surface water. We don't exactly know where the water is going to flow in the urban area. It could rely on the height of a curb. It could rely on poor drainage maintenance. So it's really difficult to model. And if you can't model, then you need to think more precautionary and not use the absence of data as an excuse not to act. And again, bringing that final point about how reliable that is the information we've got. <coughs> it's the best we have, but we still need to treat it with caution and try and think more precautionary as well. So, in the UK, as a result of all the floods we had in the first decade of the 21st century, is that it really changed how we thought about things. We had a big event in 2007 where two-thirds of the people who got flooded weren't at risk from flooding. And that really changed the mindset of how we manage flooding. How can I be at risk from flooding if I wasn't on the flood risk maps, if I'm not at risk from flooding? It's because it was, came from intense rainfall events, flooding urban areas, not from the rivers and the sea. So our floodplain maps 
indicative floodplain maps and so on, when that's a disuse or for this source of risk. So we have this problem that how can you defend the line if you can't actually identify where the line is? Or if there's no one line, but there's multiple lines in this complex cityscape, how do you, where do you actually manage that event? Um, and so we actually changed a more risk manager approach where we acknowledge that certain people are going to get flooded and we can't protect everyone because we don't actually know. But we can think more precautionary and we can try and protect um, as many people as we can, but people need to be prepared to live with water. And people need to be more resilient to these events happening. Um, so, as our the final point there is that as a result of 2007, we had the PIT review in 2008, which provided recommendations that we need to manage water differently. Instead of it being the sole province of the Environment Agency and flood defence, local authorities now, from nowhere, now manage flood risk. They don't necessarily have the expertise as yet, and they're still building up the knowledge. And they're also being cut back quite harsh by the state. Um, but that's the way the governance stands at the moment, is that the local flooding is under the province of the local authorities and not the Environment Agency, which is new. So thinking about this and what we can do about it, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about risk and resilience now. Um, and try and give you some ideas about some of the research we've done at Manchester and some of the ways forward. I'm going to start off with um, much maligned Secretary of Defence, Donald Rumsfeld, um, with his quotation, which actually won um, the Poor English Award for, the, for 2002. Um, as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That's to say there are some things we don't know, but there are also these unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. <laughs> and I think this is, this is a case of someone being advised by some clever policy advisor or scientific advisor about the notion of risk and it just not being translated into practice. Because what he's saying is actually right, and it encapsulates what we've talked about in the first half of the talk, is that knowledge is incomplete, and we don't know what we don't know until we have the benefit of hindsight. And so, I'm not necessarily advocating a Donald Rumsfeld in approach to flood risk management, but perhaps, perhaps he was in the wrong agency. If he would have been in flooding, things might have been about. So, risk and resilience. Risk... Essentially, based in the insurance sector, um, about probability and became scientized in line with being able to work out what's the probability of an event and how can we financially recompense that. But it also created this idea that we need to measure it to act. To actually do something or make a decision, we need to know what type of risk is it? What is the probability of that event? And we think about risk, classically, it's Risk is hazard times vulnerability. As if you have a hazard and you have a vulnerable people, you're at risk. Um, this has more recently been unpacked a little bit more detail where to have a risk, you need a hazard. You need the flood event. You need the water. And then you need the exposure. You need the people spatially living in houses exposed to the risk. But you also need to be vulnerable. If you have a house on still, so you live in flats, even though spatially you're exposed, you're not vulnerable. So thinking about it from an intervention perspective, we can address each of these elements, hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, which I'm going to talk about in the next part. Um, and this is led to this sort of new term that's come into the sort of planning lexicon is about resilience, how we need to be more resilient. It's a very attractive term. Um, people politicians like to be associated with it. So positive connotations like sustainability. But we need to work out what it actually means. Um, and that's two main understandings. The first one is about this reactive engineering equilibrium approach. Um, to sort of build resilience in a house, for example. Um, it's quite reactive. We know it's going to flood. We're going to use um, different kind of air bricks to stop the water penetrating the house. We also need to adapt to our equilibrium changing, which is about different governance structures being more resilient, able to intervene in a better way. 
Insurance is seen as a, a strand of enabling people to be resilient themselves. By making insurance more available, people in turn can make themselves more resilient. So increasing the capacity to cope and respond is the second part, which also links to more the social parts of planning. So what might more sustainable, resilient cities look like? Um, First of all, I'm going to talk about exposure, because this is one thing that we're most more comfortable with as planners, because it's what we do. It's quite spatial. Don't build on the floodplain. So we have... Um, managing exposure to risk is something we're very comfortable with. We know that if it's a... If it's in a floodplain area, we shouldn't necessarily build there. And it's the one strand of the risk triangle, the hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, that we do actually do quite well and we have done well for a while. Um, we do need to measure it to be able to work, however. But we can actually reduce exposure quite well, given the governance mechanisms at our disposal. And then this works quite well with some of these slides that Ray had. Uh, this shape is Greater Manchester. Two and a half million people, ten local authorities. Manchester's about the middle, Bolton, Stockport, Townside, and so on. And then we actually did one step on from Ray's slide, is that we actually looked at the land surface area within Greater Manchester and modelled how an average type of surface, what's the runoff rate? And then because we, we actually tabulated the rainfall data with the land use data, we could work out how runoff might increase in an average rainfall event. Um, and this slide is trying, has been quite good at encouraging Greater Manchester authorities to engage with green infrastructure, for example, to try and think about storing water in the urban area. So we have on the top left the model surface runoff. Um, the darker blue, the higher the runoff areas, and then as you get to the 2080 low and 2080 is high, we're on target for the 2080 is high at the moment, um, we should get 56% more rain, results in 82% more runoff. So we're going to get runoff behind the defences. And it also means that the other scary thing about this is that it doesn't build in any new development or land or housing over the next 70 years. So it's going to be high, even higher than that unless we start thinking about runoff and storing water within the urban area. And this um, is a similar slide. It's got the Greater Manchester authorities exploded outwards. And it's, if you look at the arrows, that's the direction the water flows. We have the Pennine Hills around the north and the west, and the water generally runs in this direction to World Manchester and Salford. So we've modelled all where the water goes and the relative size of the event, and then we're putting the housing allocations that the government wants to build in each area. So Salford, which is already the area at most risk in Manchester, is in a little bit of trouble because no matter what they do within their administrative boundaries, and that's where their power lies, if all these new homes are built, 150,000 new homes, associated infrastructure, are going to be built upstream of Salford. So they're the people who are going to manage the water and the development from Barry, Bolton and so on. So this really now indicates how we need to think about the city region and administrative boundaries being a starting point for partnerships. So we need to think about perhaps allowing Salford to develop and encouraging Barry to store water, for example, upstream, and start to think, well, why should they do that? Because they want to develop equally as much as the next area. And so you have <coughs> these political discussions now about how can we adapt to a kind of environment where certain <coughs> local authorities don't have the power to influence beyond the boundaries, and they're at risk from the other person's policies. So. Um, it also is affected because the Conservative government, one of the first things they did when they got in power was to abolish the regional tier, which was actually 
quite useful for this kind of thing, <laughs> to get people to think beyond their local and national boundaries. So, at the moment we're in Manchester, we're working towards new partnership work, we've set up a new administrative unit called the Greater Manchester Authorities, which is all ten authorities now working together to try and think about water across the entire city as a whole, to try and look at runoff, because Manchester is it's in land, and it does have some flooding from uh, the rivers, but mainly it's interurban flooding as well. So that's the hazard. To think about the hazards, not static, it's dynamic, it's going to increase, and we need to think about tackling that as well as just where do we build. And then we also have vulnerability, which is the ninth part of the triangle. This, um, this really illustrative picture of the police and fire station in the Carlisle 2005 floods, um, which was the centre of their emergency response. Um, and so because their fire station and police station was on the floodplain, it flooded, they couldn't respond. So thinking about vulnerability more widely, is that you can be vulnerable to being able to respond by where you actually locate key agencies. I also want to stress that it's about places and people. Certain people are vulnerable and certain places are more vulnerable than others. And it's also about outcomes and context. And I'm going to touch on those two points in the next two slides. But first of all, I want to talk about this historical element that unfortunately we are where we are. Built form changes around 1% per annum. <coughs> really inhibits our ability to think strategically and to think about the kind of city we want to live in. And this is a, a good example of how things don't actually change. This is the Great Fire of London in 1666. The red area is the extent of the fire. It happened on a, a Thursday and Friday. And it happened partly because of the materials we use. We use very wood-orientated um, building, very close together. Fire jumped from one building to another. Close together, so you couldn't get access in between to put the fire out. So the way we'd actually had the built form made us more vulnerable to experiencing a hazard. And that happened on the Thursday and Friday, and then on Arch Opportunist, Sir Christopher Wren on Monday, put in his new plan for rebuilding Monday, uh, London to the King, which was based on these spacious European boulevards, where we could actually have access along lanes, to be less at risk from fire, and so on. And the reason why it didn't happen is exactly the same reason why it wouldn't happen today. It's embedded property rights. People own small parcels of land, and they just build on top, and rebuild, and recover, and so on. So you don't actually have the power to influence spatially with some of the planning mechanisms we have. It focuses on new development, not existing. And that's a real problem for thinking about hazards like flooding. This next slide outlines what we might call outcome vulnerability, which is how you can be vulnerable due to the failure of one end point. This was a queue for water um, in a Tesco car park after the 2007 floods, where um, the flooding actually flooded a water and sewage station, so it couldn't provide fresh water. So we've got people now at risk from the effects of flooding who have not been flooded. So as a result, the Environment Agency decided to do uh, a check of how many of their critical infrastructure is at risk. And it came back with some quite scary figures. that So I think 55% of all the water treatment works in England and Wales are at risk from flooding because they're built by the rivers on the floodplains. Um, we have the hospitals, schools, all at risk from flooding, all are making ourselves more vulnerable to the effects of flooding. And so you can be, flooding might, not, might affect you even if you're not flooded yourself. So we have these secondary impacts as well. So that's outcome vulnerability. And now I'm going to turn to it's called contextual vulnerabilities. It's some people are more vulnerable than others. This is a man during the New Orleans floods, um, adapting quite well to his new environment. And then on the other hand, we have um, the east coast of England, huge amount of caravan sites all down the coast, less planning regulations on them, and it's most, certain people are more vulnerable than others, the elderly, the young, 
the disabled and so on. And we have less planning regulations, for example, on, on caravans that don't actually link into the emergency response <laughs> systems and the warning systems. And they may not have access to escape as well as other parts of the area. So certain people are more vulnerable than others. And part of it is also due to this feeling of engagement and access to resources, is that some parts of the population can mobilise resources and get defences built in areas and other people can't. And so perhaps as planners and people concerned with engagement and people is that we need to think about how to increase the ability to cope to people. How can we increase uh, people so they're less vulnerable to the effects of flooding, even if it's a deep flooded. And autonomous adaptation is essential to the Bangkok example. So some people do adapt without the state playing any role whatsoever. So thinking about what this might look like, um, trying to think about the nature of the future city, one more able to be less vulnerable and absorb more water. Now under our maps, we need to think about where the water goes, but it's where we are as well. The dots, for example, might show where our critical infrastructure is, which needs to be highly protected. Or we might have areas um, where we might want to restrict development due to really low sewer capacity, for example. And it's about linking the natural and the built environment. So, for example, we might have areas which are sort of green space or more sandy, more absorbent, so more highly protected than those on clay. Clay, which could actually be released for development under a different way of looking at the city rather than green belts just as a constraint for land or as a leisure purpose, more multifunctional, thinking about land having multiple purposes. But then we're thinking about resilience in practice and particularly regarding the project we're on at the moment is that we need to have a, a note of caution. Is that there's not one person who would argue against resilience on itself as its merits and that's quite dangerous because it seems to have come through into the political landscape without the checks and balances really being applied. But when you think about what resilience might mean there's going to be winners and losers. Resilience essentially in a flooding world might be applied at the building scale. And what we find in the UK is people are now, there's a speech by a government minister last week saying exactly this, people are now expected to buy their own flood resilience measures to apply to their house. Now, this commodification of risk is going to create winners and losers. Some people can, some people can't. Richer areas might be able to move, poor areas might not. Um, and people are now being told to be more responsible to, for their own flood protection. How much risk are you willing to accept? Is, um, it comes up on the flood risk maps when you buy a house. If you want to live there, essentially it's going to be your issue and your problem. But what we're finding in the research is people don't necessarily buy that. They just want to be protected. You're the experts, we pay our taxes, stop it flooding. And so when we talk about resilience, we need to think about it affecting a population who might resist resilience in practice. So it's not benign, it will have effects, it will have winners and losers. Now, that's not to say that it can't be useful, it's but it will have equity issues as well. So think about sort of key messages from this talk is that we know flooding's dynamic. It's driven by difficult to predict and very uncertain forces. Um, and then critically from the UK perspective, is this risk has shifted. It shifted from rivers in the sea to interurban events, and that's really shook everything up. Is so that we don't necessarily map these things on well onto how decisions are made and how we manage water as a whole of society. So we've also had to think about our flood governance. It's become more precautionary. Don't rely too much on quantification evidence-based decisions. Although people in authority love evidence-based decisions because it's a way to show the paper trail for how they make those decisions. So there's more of an ownership for multiple agencies on managing flood risk together. 
trying to work across disciplines, which is a point Frank made right at the start about different disciplines working together, trying to complement engineering approaches with more social and planning and design features as well.